Funding for Idaho Reports is provided by the Friends of 4, 10, and 12, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by a grant from the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation. Prisons are among the best industries for a community to have in that they create no pollution at all, either air or, or auto or any kind. Uh, they provide a very stable economy. There's no cyclical uh, boom and bust period. Uh, there's really no intercourse at all between the inmates and the townspeople. If two brothers from Pennsylvania have their way, the long-abandoned TB hospital in Gooding will get a new lease on life as a private prison. We'll look at that story tonight. Good evening. Engineers and architects were looking over the old state hospital in Gooding, Idaho today as private prison developers continued to eye that facility with an eye toward converting it to a privately operated mid mid medium security prison, a prison that would house inmates from several western states. Some of the principles in the deal are quoted as saying that agreements on the use of the old hospital and some surrounding land is indeed very close. We'll be talking about that more in just a moment. If plans go ahead for a prison in Gooding, it would place Idaho on the leading edge of a major change in the way this country's prisons are operated. With inmate populations continuing to grow in virtually every state, some experts see the private operation of regional prisons as a wave of the future. But others see the concept as loaded with problems. That's the focus of our broadcast tonight. We begin with Gene McNeil's report from Gooding. For years now, the residents of Gooding have looked longingly at these abandoned buildings that once housed a private college and a TB hospital, and they've wondered why nobody seemed to be able to find a use for them. Well, somebody finally has, and economically speaking, it looks like Christmas in July for this small community. A $10 million annual budget that would mean hundreds of new jobs and a lot more money to go around. In fact, it looks so good that not even the idea of 700 prison inmates for neighbors seems to bother too many people. Developer Joe Fenton has been in Gooding this week negotiating to buy both the state-owned TB hospital and the privately owned buildings that surround it. Although a couple of problems remain, Fenton says a deal could be worked out in a few days and ground could be broken as early as six months from now. This is no ordinary prison Fenton and his brother Charlie want to build here. For one thing, it would be privately owned, one of the first prisons for profit in the country. That idea has drawn charges of charlatanism from some in the industry, but Joe Fenton says that's not fair. Uh, that's almost an indictment against the private business or private business in, in general. Uh, the same argument could be applied to private hospitals, to private uh, universities or colleges. If we don't, in fact, uh, do a better job that they can do for these inmates at a better price, they're probably not going to use our services. But more importantly, our family's been in this business for over 50 years. Uh, Charlie's made it a career for over 30 years. Our father uh, entered the business in the early 30s. Um, we think that there's a service that we're, that we're providing, and that's the fundamentals of why we're in it. The proposed prison will be regional, available to all 13 western states, and it will take only protective custody prisoners, those who have to be segregated from other inmates for their own safety. Fenton says that's the group they can do the most for. Within the state system, they have to lock their PCs into solitary confinement. Basically, those people can do nothing productively, nothing to defray the expense. Meals are brought to them, visitors are brought to them, everything is a personalized service. We'll have an open institution, and, and by specializing, uh, we'll be able to operate with these people less expensively than the state can operate with these people. Benton's brother, Charlie, has come under attack from the American Civil Liberties Union for allegedly abusing prisoners. Charlie Fenton wouldn't talk to us, but his brother says the charges are untrue. Well, I expect that uh, the American Civil Liberties Union really didn't do the speaking. It was an individual. And probably that individual uh, has never been an inmate in a prison that Charlie has run. Uh, inmates who have been in prisons that Charlie has run that I'm aware of have been very thankful for the way he runs prisons because prisons either are run by the administration or they're run by inmates. 
uh, if they're run by an administration that, that uh, is concerned, then the inmates have good meals, they live in safety, they, they, they can uh, have a productive opportunity in the environment they're in. If they're in an institution where other inmates run it, they're going to live in fear. Gooding Mayor Gene Heller is an avid supporter of the Fentons, and he says the charges against Charlie don't bother him. I have no concern whatsoever. I, I feel that the, uh, the union was uh, probably taking something somewhat out of context and uh, dwelling upon a, a, an insignificant uh, concern that, uh, that was of very little bearing upon the actual capabilities and the uh, uh, management uh, capacity of, of the Fentons. For Gooding, the bottom line, of course, is money. Like many towns, this one was hard hit by the recession, and unemployment is still running about 10% here. A regional prison would mean jobs and a whole lot more. Because we're a private corporation, we pay taxes. Uh, this property hasn't paid taxes since it's been owned by the state. Uh, we'll be providing jobs in a community that's been losing jobs. Uh, over a period of time, our, our payroll will run up from 200 to 300 people. Uh, to the degree that we're, it's competitively possible, we'll be buying goods and services locally. Uh, All together, uh, our operational budget will run in the neighborhood of $10 million a year. Despite those economic benefits, it isn't often you find a town welcoming a prison with open arms, as this one is apparently doing. Although we found some confusion about what types of inmates would be housed here, and a little concern for security, most of the comments we got were decidedly positive. I think it's one of the best things that happened to getting. I would like to see the building put to use, because I think it's sad to see buildings deteriorate. I don't have any objection to it other than uh, I'd like to see what the security is. Other than that, other than that that's the only objection I would have is if the security wasn't adequate. What do you think of it? Well, I think Gooding needs some industry in here, and I think it puts some people to work, and I hope they know what they're doing, and I really think it might be a good thing. Well, it might create a few jobs, but, you know, a lot of people might worry about the problem of prison break. Or... It's, it's good. We need it. We need people's jobs. We need it. But support is not unanimous, especially among people who live near the proposed site. Three of them expressed concerns to us, but only one would talk for the record. Farmer Jay Brown, who is deaf, says the prison won't help the economy that much and it may hurt land values. But mostly, he says, it will change the nature of the community. I don't think that I want my town to be known as a, as a home for a prison. I like it well, like it is. We can drive up town now and not have to be a good a driver. If I wanted to live by a big town, I'd move to Twin Falls or Boise or somewhere. And they say that uh, prisoners will never escape, but I can't believe that. I don't worry about that myself. I'm a man, but I can't help but think that all the people in this town will worry about somebody hiding out in the garage or somewhere and get out. If they get out, I think the people will be more on edge. But for the most part, the mayor is right. Even people who fought tooth and nail against a proposed women's prison here three years ago are now supporting a much larger men's prison. I contribute this to the fact that we, as the uh, leadership of this community, which is both city and chamber of commerce people, we've been concerned with being up front. Everything we've done with this has been out in front of the public. We've had several public meetings. We've had the Fentons down here on uh, a couple of occasions, and we've had uh, Al Murphy down here, and he has been a great, a great asset to the promotion of this particular circumstance because he is an upfront man. And let's face it, uh, again, depressed economy and circumstances. People know we have to do it, and this may be the last opportunity for something to happen. More on this story now with one of the principals in Buckingham Security, the Pennsylvania company seeking to locate a private prison in Gooding, Idaho. You've just seen Joe Fenton on videotape. He and his brother have been in Gooding this week working on the prison project. What can you tell me, Mr. Fenton, about how close you are to making a deal there? Given uh, the time that we've had to operate, uh, we've had a good deal of progress. Uh, we've met with the uh, 
town council, the city council of Gooding, and that's gone as far as it can in the time frame that we've had. We've met with neighboring uh, property owners, and we've, uh, we are aware of what needs to be done for us to complete a deal with them. We're very satisfied. You need to buy, as I understand it, some r land immediately adjacent to the, to the old hospital facility in order to give you enough, enough space to operate. We think that the original 40-acre tract is well designed to serve our purposes. Need might be a strong term, but very desirable. Okay. Uh, so you, uh, what's left, to, I guess, what's left to, to, to do to put together this package? There are, in any, in any uh, transaction, not only are there uh, meetings of the minds that need to occur, but there are technical, legal aspects that need to be met. And uh, to my knowledge right now, the attorneys are looking at some of those. How quickly can it happen? Uh, we think that a whole series of things have to come together. Uh, I can't really put a time frame on it. If they all happen as I can foresee them, we'd hope that we'd be able to begin construction in six months. But as you, and as you sit here tonight, I take it there's little doubt that it will eventually happen. We think that, that uh, the most important questions have been asked and been answered, but there are a lot of details, and uh, Yogi Bear is famous for saying that it ain't over till it's over. Let me ask you finally, Mr. Fenton, about the attitudes in that community. Does that mean a lot to you that the people in Gooding seem to be so behind this project? It means a whole lot. Uh, we're no different than another individual or another <coughs> company. Uh, you like to go where you're made to feel welcome. The people of Gooding, the leadership of Gooding, and the citizenry have made it very clear to us that uh, they would like to have us come. And that's a very attractive community. And Idaho is. Uh, a very attractive place for us to be. We're very, very happy. We'll come back in a moment, sir. Thank you. As the mayor of Gooding suggested a moment ago on videotape, the director of the Idaho Department of Corrections has been a principal booster of the Gooding prison idea. Al Murphy, of course, runs the Idaho prison system. How close is the deal from your perspective, Mr. Murphy? From my perspective, uh, I think the package is, uh, correctionally, is, is done. and. Uh, I'm not a real estate agent, so I'm pulling back from the rest of it. But I think the package is, is pretty well complete. The idea behind it, the correctional philosophy behind it, makes all the sense in the world. It's certainly innovative. Um, it's certainly in an area where juvenile corrections were 10, 15 years ago when states started getting out of it and going to the private vendor. So I think um, from our standpoint, at least correctionally, the building's suitable. The community desperately wants it. Uh, there's a lot of acceptance there. There's a private enterprise that is interested in doing it. There's 13 states that are interested in, in participating in it, and it makes a lot of correctional sense. Let me ask you a few of the specifics about just how this would work in terms of the kinds of people that are likely to be at this prison. Uh, at one time, a few months ago, you were talking about um, a prison hospital now it has become a protective custody, medium security institution. Why the change? I think basically the change was, is we knew we had to have a regionalized concept, and the 13 states looked at what do we need for special people. Protective custody was one of them, hospitalization. When you look at that was a hospital and originally designed for it, and then it makes it very adaptable. We asked the Federal Bureau of Prisons to come in and take a look at it. Uh, they've looked at it. Um, private entrepreneurs have looked at it. The Federal Bureau of Prisons is somewhat interested in it, but uh, you have to look at the economic value. Private entrepreneurs looking at protective custody as being their biggest area of expertise and where the ec economic benefits are, and they're offering that they'll come in, run it as a protective custody unit. So you're saying, in essence, there's more demand for a protective custody facility Clearly. than than for the hospital facility. There's no question. Okay. What kind of prisoners are we talking about when we talk about protective custody? You're talking basically people who have a snitch label, somebody who was informed, uh, somebody who has had antisocial behavior, just doesn't get along well with other people. Uh, some people who are weak, haven't done time in prison, and, and are being preyed on by other prisoners. Those basically, the, the type of person who you used to see when you were a kid, always with the bloody nose getting beaten up on a ball field. Is, uh, let me ask, go back to Mr. Fenton for just a moment and ask him about that. Is that, is that your view of the kind of prisoner that's likely to be there? They're certainly included. Uh, anyone who's a victim in an institution or a potential victim, uh, though that category covers uh, many of them. People who have uh, 
for one reason or another, uh, are, find themselves being the victim of other inmates, and they've got no place to go. Uh, in the institutions where they're at, they're, they tend to be locked into what we know of, or used to know of, as solitary confinement, which is an awful life. Uh, so that the people that w will be coming to us will have a chance to get out of solitary confinement, if you will, and live in an open institution. Let me ask you both about a quote that I read today in the Gooding County Leader, the local paper in Gooding, a quote from Bob Watson, who's the Oregon Corrections Director. He was asked about what kind of people Oregon might be interested in sending to such a facility, and he said, quote, they, some of them would be incredibly violent and dangerous, end quote. I'm wondering if the people in Gooding really know that, Mr. Murphy. We told the folks in Gooding, and I've taken the position that I'm here just as a broker and trying to translate it. And we told the people in Gooding, number one, these, what you're getting is a prison, and that's it. It is a prison, that means you're dealing with prisoners. Uh, these are people who have been violent. They're people who... So these are not just ne necessarily guys who no. are marking time, waiting to get out, and not going to cause any no. trouble. Of course not. Of course you, not. When you get 650 males together, uh, it doesn't matter whether they're on an, in a Navy ship or in the Army or whether they're on the street, uh, they're going to run into all kinds of patterns. Some are going to be more aggressive than others. Um, when you quote someone out of context, you can come up with some very emphatic statements. Uh, that sounds to me like a quote that came out of a contextual uh, meaning that probably didn't mean exactly and specifically that. But you would not disagree that some of these people are oh, going to sure. be incredibly violent. And incredibly uh, is, uh, is a word that leads a lot to the imagination. Well, let's, let's drop the adjective and say violent and dangerous. Some are, for sure. Uh, okay. People who are in prison, in, no, they're not all Boy Scouts and virgins. They're just not going to be all that. Let me ask, uh, finally, Mr. Murphy, about the decision to go with a private operator as opposed to the... At one time, again, there was talk of the Federal Bureau of right. Corrections basically contracting to operate the, the facility. Why a private operator? The decision basically belonged to the community, and that's the way I put it. These are your options. These are what I can present to you. Your options are basically, yes, you want a prison. No, you don't want a prison. Maybe the Federal Bureau of Prisons, maybe a private entrepreneur. You people decide what you want to do with it. And you're, I guess, more than comfortable with that decision. I think, I think as far as the business goes, corrections, I think that's the trend of the future. I think it makes all the sense in the world, both economically, the benefit of the client, and for the industry as a whole. I think we need to look at other options and try some stuff that haven't been done before. Gentlemen, we'll come back. Thank you. Our final view of this tonight comes from a lawyer who I think it's safe to say has some concerns about the for-profit prison concept. David Nevin is in private practice in Boise. He is a former Ada County public defender. So what are your concerns, Mr. Nevin? Uh, I think my concerns are not, first of all, uh, with the abstract concept of private prisons. It may well be, as Mr. Murphy says, the wave of the future. Um, I think that traditionally, of course, uh, the business of, of housing, uh, imprisoning people, has been a state function, and now it's clear uh, on many different fronts that there is a parallel private uh, enterprise that's uh, achieving some of those, doing some of those same tasks. And I don't see anything, uh, in theory, wrong with the idea of a private prison. Uh, there are, however, so the bottom line for, for people who are working in the area of individual rights is how are people going to be treated, how are prisoners going to be treated. That's, a, that's an issue not only just for the individual prisoners, but uh, most people who go to prison, and probably all the people who, uh, who go to this prison, will someday get out. And we as a society, uh, the entire state, have an interest in seeing to it that those people, that the, that to the greatest extent possible, those people don't go back to prison and don't continue to do antisocial uh, acts after they've been released from prison. So we all have an interest in how people are treated in the prison setting. Well, I, I just don't know, it isn't clear to me based on how the thing is set up at this point, exactly how we're going to be holding the, the people who are running that prison accountable. Um, I'm concerned about that. In other words, who's going to check up on these folks to make sure they're running a good prison? Yeah, uh, the, the, and, and that's certainly one issue. Um, and and there, are, there are established ways for, uh, for, for inmate lawsuits uh, challenging prison conditions, and I think many of those same standards would be applicable in the private setting as well. No reason why those kinds of lawsuits couldn't be brought, and I'm, I'm sure they probably will. I do, however, have some concern uh, about the, the the notion, uh, the, the possible interplay between the profit motive 
and the, the goals of running uh, a prison. Uh, I don't know that they're necessarily incompatible, but certainly um, there will be areas in which... Uh, Give me a for instance. Oh, uh, uh, what is going to be the, um, the ratio of, of uh, people involved in rehabilitation to the number of prisoners in the, uh, in the uh, prison? Uh, psychologist to uh, inmate ratio, uh, teacher to inmate ratio. Uh, clearly, it will be in the, um, in the private prison's uh, interest to have that be um, a relatively uh, a high ratio, in other words, a, a great number of prisoners per... Um, because it would be cheaper for them to operate. Exactly. In the same way, isn't the same thing true, though, of a state prison system where budget cuts come and that's one of the first places that frequently gets uh, cut back or those, ki those sorts of services for inmates? Well, that may be a fact of political life, but uh, it doesn't always tend to work that way. And it may not tend to work that way in the private setting either. I'm not saying it necessarily will, but I think there is that possible tendency. And that can take very many subtle forms, yeah. uh, a lesser quality of food, a uh, different uh, <coughs> kind of... Uh, a housing facility that's available, those kinds of things. I see. Let me ask you finally, Mr. Nevin, if this goes through in Gooding and this facility is located there, do we at minimum in Idaho, by statute or some other method, need some standards for how to operate this facility? Uh, that, that's certainly one thing I wanted to say, uh, and uh, very important. I, I, in my estimation, uh, just having taken a brief look at the code, I don't think there's anything uh, I don't think the legislature has previously addressed this question. I think there should be a statutory framework for overseeing and uh, uh, just keeping an eye on this uh, kind of an institution. Well, on, on that point, let me open it up and go back to Mr. Murphy. Do we need that, Mr. Murphy? No, I don't think so. Uh, if you're going to apply some statutory regulations, I think they're, they're already applied, at least in, in Section 1983 of the U.S. Code, where you certainly open to litigation. But the reality is the industry has standards. And looking at the standards, uh, the Fenton say they're going to be within standards. I don't know. I know that there is nothing close to meeting standards within Idaho's operations, uh, either structurally or how we're operating those facilities. Uh, the Fenton say they're going to do. In terms of you're overcrowded and we're overcrowded. The rooms aren't the, the correct size. Certainly, staffing ratios aren't correct. Certainly, social services aren't correct. We don't come close to meeting our own industry standards. They're very tough to meet. I think as far as myself, as a person going to a vendor, I'm going to look at the person providing the services. If he's not going to provide the services that I want, even though I can't provide them for my own, then I'm not going to contract with him. Well, uh, on that point, uh, there are these allegations made by somebody in the ACLU about Mr. Fenton and his operation. How carefully did you check them out? Charlie Fenton is, is, is well known within corrections. What's happened to Charlie Fenton is this. First of all, he's done a lot of consulting work since he's been out of Federal Bureau of Prisons, contracting with both the military and the National Institute of Corrections. Those folks don't give consulting contracts to people who are inaccurate. The allegations were some inmates brought allegations that they were beaten by with pick handles. They went to court. The inmates lost. And I would suggest this. A civil suit is certainly a lot easier to come forth and win in a criminal suit. So you don't, the bottom line is you don't have any concerns about that? No, about of course that. not. Or uh, would you, Mr. Fenton, would you concede Mr. Nevin's point that accountability might at least theoretically be a problem? No. Uh, we are uh, designing this facility after having met with the people with the ACA at length. Uh, Mr. Murphy just indicated that physically uh, what's available in Idaho does not meet ACA standards. That's not unusual. No, virtually every state in the union. ACA is the American American Corrections, Corrections Association, okay. which is to corrections uh, what the AMA is to to medicine. Uh, it's it's the standardizing body, if you will. So you're going to meet those standards, and there it would be redundant to have some state standard on top of that. Well, in addition to that, we're contracting with states now. No state can uh, maintain a contract with us if we don't operate under standards that, uh, that are satisfactory to them. Let me get Mr. Nevin back in this. Yeah, the, the issue is uh, how you go about uh, verifying that, in, in my estimation. A private prison is a place that's, uh, uh, that's a, it's a private institution, and, and access can be uh, controlled, access to that uh, facility can be controlled by the people who run it. 
And I would like to see a, a framework set up by which uh, there is actual physical access to the facility in people who are in the business of, of uh, riding herd on these kinds of facilities. Well, people uh, like, uh, what, state legislators? Uh, you bet. State legislators, uh, people who are active in, uh, in prison condition litigation, uh, people of this sort. A, a, a set up framework that's uh, arranged in advance, that's uh, uh, provided by statute, uh, by which uh, there, there's capacity for that regulation. We expect to really establish a standard for the industry. Uh, we look forward to the opportunity to be inspected. We expect to be a showcase in the United States. Uh, uh, now, we are dealing with protective custody people. We're going to have to screen very carefully the people who uh, are coming and going. And the reason for that is obvious. Uh, not only some of these people uh, are being protected from people not only within an institution but from without an institution. Uh, but within those constraints, we welcome inspection. Uh, we will ask uh, Mr. Murphy in the state of Idaho to inspect us as they inspect their own ins institution. Mr. Nevin? But, uh, yeah, who, who will inspect when, on what terms? Uh, how do we assure as a people that those inspections will be undertaken by someone who's uh, uh, unbiased in the arrangement. Doesn't it seem many, reasonable many to write that into a con it, the state of Idaho to write that into its contract, presumably with? Clearly, I think what I would do is, I've gone through the accreditation process, and what I would do is say meet the standards and go to the commission on accreditation, just as every hospital goes through accreditation processes. Get yourself accredited and let those folks be the auditor, but let the people who are experts. I wouldn't expect to go into an attorney's office and audit his office, even though that I'm well familiar with the law. I don't think that, I think the American Bar Association should be the auditor on their own profession, just as the American Correctional Association should be the auditor on their own profession. Let me briefly raise one other point. Mr. Nevin, I'm sure you have defended or at least know of some of these protective custody inmates in this state. Could not a setting like this be ultimately beneficial for these sorts of prisoners? Oh, absolutely. There is, uh, in I terms think of their existence being pretty, pretty bad now, they're locked up in Idaho, I guess, 23 out of 24 hours a day. Great potential for benefit in a, in a system such as this. But, of course, there's also great potential for benefit in simply expanding prison facilities, and that's one way of looking at what this accomplishes. Should we build a new, should we simply uh, ha have a bond issue and build a new prison? <laughs> um, and if we did that, uh, we'd certainly have facilities that were more up-to-date and more accommodating, and, and that's one of the things that an arrangement like this achieves. Definitely potential for benefit. I'm saying there's also the, the potential for abuse, and that's my concern. Okay. Uh, well, gentlemen, uh, I think we're going to have to leave it on that point. I'm, I'm uh, looking forward to seeing how this turns out, as I'm sure lots of folks are. Mr. Fenton, it's very good of you to join us tonight. Mr. Murphy, same thank with you. you. Mr. Nevin, thank you for being with us. We appreciate it. That's our time for tonight. We'll be back here on Monday with other news permitting, a look at the grasshopper plague that is affecting farmers in southern Idaho. A decision on possible money to spray those grasshoppers could come on Monday. We'll have that story then. I'm Mark Johnson. Good night. Funding for Idaho Reports is provided by the Friends of 4, 10, and 12, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by a grant from the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation.